Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. On our show today, former Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara discusses the ghost of Woodrow Wilson. President Woodrow Wilson. At the end of the First World War, Wilson proposed what he called peace without victory. His plan involved two principal components. First, reconciling Germany with the rest of Europe. Second, establishing a League of Nations. In the end, both components of Wilson's plan were rejected. During the peace negotiations at Versailles, the other European powers, far from reconciling with Germany, insisted on imposing heavy reparations on Germany. Then, here in the United States, the Senate rejected the treaty under which we ourselves would have participated in the League of Nations. If Wilson's magnanimous peace plan had been followed, might the Second World War have been prevented? We'll never know. But now, at the end of the Cold War, a similarly generous, magnanimous foreign policy might do its own part to prevent conflict, or so at least contends Robert McNamara. Robert S. McNamara was born during the First World War, served in the Second World War, and then as Secretary of Defense to Presidents John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, participated in the Cold War, overseeing our military involvement in Vietnam. In his recent book, Wilson's Ghost, Robert McNamara, a man who has seen his full share of war, lays out his vision for peace. Mr. Secretary, a central argument in your book is that the United States must avoid seeming arrogant. Again and again, you warn against American high-handedness, high overweening American pride, American arrogance. Now, with that in mind, I want to remind you that Abraham Lincoln called this nation the last best hope of man on earth. Was Lincoln being arrogant? He would be the last person to be arrogant in the first place at the time. The nation didn't have the power True. to support, I'll call it, arrogance. But Lincoln was not an arrogant person. If you look at the way he handled the nation, both before the Civil War and after the Civil War, he was not an arrogant person. Uh, With I malice toward none, charity toward all. Exactly. All right, exactly. So what, what today, I want... today, do we say uh, malice toward none, charity toward all? No. We say we are the most powerful nation in the world, economically, politically, militarily. And we are. And we're going to continue to be, as far ahead as I can see, certainly for half a century. And on occasion after occasion, we demand that the world not just accept our leadership, but do as we say they should do. Okay, now I want to press you on this point just a little bit because we have this notion of American exceptionalism is a basic tenet of our political life. The well, notion, I believe we're exceptional. Right, okay. So the notion that, let me spell it out, the notion that our principles give us a special mission in the world and to some extent, the unavoidable corollary is that to some extent, this nation is better than other nations and that's been believed by Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Lincoln, both Roosevelt's, John Kennedy, the president you served, Ronald Reagan, the president I served, that is not, in your view, inconsistent with the kind of empathy that you, you advocate. No. I'm very proud to be an American. Right. I think we have some extraordinary faults. Let me just mention one. We are the most powerful nation in the world, the richest nation in the world. In the capital of the richest nation in the world, Washington, D.C., today, the infant mortality rate is twice that of Castro's Cuba. Does that give us... Uh, special wisdom to demand the rest of the world behave as we are behaving or as we think they should? No. I think we should lead, but I don't think we should dictate. Okay. And if we cannot persuade other nations with comparable values and comparable interests to follow our leadership, we should not apply our power unilaterally. If we had have followed that, that dictate, we would not have been in Vietnam. It was not one of our major allies, not Japan, not Germany, not Britain, France, that we're, we're willing this to is support a good us idea in Vietnam. Right. We are not omniscient. Now, Mr. Secretary, let me... We're not omnipotent either, although since the end of the Cold War, we've gotten pretty close, which raises the question of how we should treat our former adversaries. The kernel of your book is the argument, again, let me quote you, that you discern, I'm quoting from the book, you discern an eerie resonance between Germany's feelings of betrayal in 1919 and those of Russia and China now following the Cold War. Explain your argument. Let, let me, uh, the long answer. Go right ahead. Allow me. Go right ahead. Uh, my earliest memory, you will find this hard to believe. You were born in 1916. My earliest memory as a child is of a city exploding with joy. 
the city was San Francisco where I was born in 1916, as you say. The date of this memory was November 11, 1918, Armistice Day. I was two years old. The city was exploding with joy for the obvious reason we had won World War I. But a great many of the people, and certainly the president, Woodrow Wilson, believed we'd won a war to end all wars. My God, how wrong we were. Because the human race, we human beings, killed 160 million other human beings uh, in the 20th century. It was a century of carnage. Is that what we want in the 21st century? I don't think so. If we don't, what can we learn from the 20th that will help prevent that? One of the things we can learn is to try to avoid war between or among great powers. Now, if you look at what's happened in the last 50 years, I think that two most geo most important geopolitical events, other than the end of the Cold War, were the reconciliation between France and Germany after hundreds of years of war, and the reconciliation between the US and Japan after one of the bloodiest wars which I was part of in all of human history. Now, if we could, today it's inconceivable that France and Germany or Japan and US would be at war any time in, you know, in the next half century or so. Can't we do that with respect to the other great powers, particularly with respect to China and Russia? That is a major thesis of the book. Well, but in your book, you say that uh, Japan and Germany are precisely not examples of the way we need, we need to behave now because after the Second World War, we occupied those nations well, and effectively rewrote their political lives for them. Well, you're correct. So, so what do we do no, for the no, great powers well, now? But, but the end result. Uh, that's what you want to achieve. Exactly. Right. 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 And I don't suggest we occupy right. Russia or we occupy China. Right. But, but now, I do suggest that we, we recognize the risk of conflict between the U.S. and Japan on the one hand and China on the other, or the U.S. and Russia. And I don't think we, we recognize that. And in particular, we don't apply what I call empathy toward them. I don't define empathy as sympathy. But empathy, in my mind, means trying to put ourselves in the skin of, the shoes of, uh, potential opponents and enemies. We don't do that. We don't think of the way the Chinese look at us. Right. Let me take you Let's take a closer look at our post-Cold War relations with Russia. Let me take you back to this quotation. An eerie resonance between Germany's feelings of betrayal in 1919 yes. and those of Russia and China following the Cold War. Start with Russia. Why, does, why should Russia feel betrayed? Uh, I don't want to say they should feel betrayed, but why should they feel concerned, let me put it that All way, right. at risk uh, with respect to the West? Not just the U.S., but the West. Because we have expanded NATO, and we're talking about expanding it a second time, a military alliance moved, moved eastward to their very borders. And it also, they believed that we had stated we would not do that. And that was part of the deal, they thought, for uh, integrating East and West Germany, which they approved at the end of the Cold War. And today, we're talking about bringing the Baltic states in. Now, I'm not arguing they're right. Please don't misunderstand me. What I'm arguing is we've got to think about the way the Russians look at the West. Let me, OK, let me push back on, against your thesis a little bit. Um, the historical parallel. First World War ends. Versailles Treaty Conference, and Germany is stripped of substantial portions of its territory, yeah. and the other victorious allies, France, Italy, and Great Britain, impose heavy reparations payments exactly. on Germany. All right, we now go to the end of the Cold War, and Russia, the Soviet Union, does indeed break up into Russia and a host of independent countries. Right. That's not our doing, it's Boris Yeltsin's doing. And far from imposing reparations on Russia, we, through the International Monetary Fund, provide them with billions of and dollars of aid. And the World Bank that I had it. And the World Bank that right. you had it. No, no. So my point is, all right, fine, it's terribly important in a dangerous and difficult world to understand the way an adversary, or for that matter, an ally, sees you. Yeah. But on the other hand, if the ally or, or the adversary is deluded, you ought to be able to say that too. Well, I, and I think we right. should say if we think Russia is deluded, and to some degree I think they are, but they're in a hell of a fix. And let me just give you an indication. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, in Washington, D.C., the infant mortality rate is... Uh, twice that at Castro's coup, but that is a, an important measure of, I'll call it the health of a society. Another very important measure is life expectancy. There's not anything much more fundamental 
in gauging the health of a society than life How expectancy. How long do your citizens live? Right. The Russian male life expectancy has dropped on the order of seven years in the last decade or so. It's now on the order of 57. Male life expectancy. I guess our male life expectancy is on the order of 77. Now that's a, a measure. You, you, you yourself keep beating it. I, you, you, well, you're I'm trying to extend fine. it. That's right. That's right. Uh, knock on wood. I hope I'll continue. But but my point is that that we've got to understand the way Russians look at themselves today, and they think they're in a hell of a mess, and they and are. And they're there, right? Now, okay, let me push again. But we're not solely responsible for it. But we've got to understand that they think that way, okay. and therefore, if they think we're bringing our strength to bear upon them in ways that weaken them. That causes them great fear and great concern. Be, all right. Now, you say that Russia feels cornered. That's the word that you use. Well, yeah. And, but my, my view would be, but isn't that exactly, I mean, there's a basic distinction that we need to make and that perhaps you don't make enough of in, in the thesis, which is, on the one hand, military. And there, for sure, we want the Russians cornered. We want them, no, we, no, we no, want the military no, no. option ruled out. No, no, wait a minute, wait Concentrate a minute. on your economy. We'll help you economically. We'll help you uh, get but, the wait, living wait standards up. Right, Let, go ahead. The word corner right. implies uh, that one's adversary who is cornered is in an, in an inferior position, a dangerous position. That is the last thing we want the Russians to think, that they're cornered. And one of the great evidences of the wisdom of President Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis was, he said to all of us, for God's sakes, don't let Khrushchev feel he's cornered. He'll lash out if he does. If a nation is cornered, there's the danger of lashing out. We don't want the Russians to feel they're cornered. I think what you mean to say, if I may. Go right <laughs> ahead. No, 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 go right that, ahead. That, that we want to ensure that the Russians don't feel that they have such military uh, capabilities that they can extend their hegemony across uh, either the rest of Asia or part of Europe. What I Which say is what they have. From the bear, let's turn to the dragon. China. Why, why should China feel as Germany did in 1919? Not why should they, but why do they, let's say? Because of history. You go back to the Boxer Rebellion, uh, the drug, the opium wars. Go back to what I witnessed. Uh, in August of 1937, before most of your audience was born, I was in Shanghai. I was a merchant seaman. I was in Shanghai in August of 37. I witnessed the Japanese start the Sino-Japanese War by bombing Shanghai. And then three or four years ago, the then Prime Minister, uh, Li Pong of China, told me with great vehemence and great anger that the Japanese, as a result of that action, had killed 20 million Chinese and they had not apologized. They're scared to death of a rise of militarism. And, in Japan. Now, don't misunderstand okay. me. I, I'm not suggesting so, the average Japanese wants to move that way. But what I am suggesting is that the Chinese look upon us and Japan as much stronger militarily than we are, the combination of us. Right. And, and they fear that. They fear that. Lee Pong went on to say to me, he said, Mr. McNamara, you, you just expanded and extended, those were his words, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. There could be only one purpose. That security treaty during the Cold War perhaps had a reason to protect Japan against uh, uh, an offense, uh, offense from uh, Russia. Today, it can have no purpose other than to contain and threaten China. That's the purpose of it. Well, now, that is not the purpose of it. That's not our intention. That's the way they look at it. Uh, China, by the way, is dramatically expanding its military budget today. Right. And this is causing concern in the Asia-Pacific region. It causes concern in the U.S. But you have to understand that China starts with a, a mil set of military equipment that should be in the Smithsonian Museum. It's antiquated. Of course they're going to expand. There are going to be a billion, six hundred million people, a tremendous economic base. Of course they're going to have a military. That's not the issue. We can't stop that. But what we should insist upon is that they, and Asia, Pacific region, Japan, and us discuss how that military power will be used. Can we have confidence building measures to ensure it will not be used offensively. I think we can. Okay, now here, again, let me push back a little bit. Here, there is a kind of drift or tendency in your argument, which, I'll, which I sense, and I'll, I'll state it out loud to give you the chance to correct it if I'm wrong. And it is toward 
a kind of guessing game attempting to judge the subjective state of mind of an adversary who speaks a different language, who has a different history, with whom we very seldom speak face to face. Um, I have heard George Schultz say, do your best to try to understand what is in the adversary's mind but base your decisions on his capacity, his capability. If the Chinese are building up, we want them in the same kind of box, so to speak, that we want the Russians in, which is to say that any military option on their part, we, we, ideally, we wouldn't even want it to cross their minds. Is that well, a fair, fair statement? I don't like the term box, uh, as I did like okay. the word corner. No, I know, because we, there's we, a question we, of we nuance here, and you yeah, see things differently, but I want to tease want, it out. We, at least I don't want right. our potential opponents to fear us. And, and fear that we have the intention of aggression against them. That will lead to preemptive strikes. It will lead to friction. That's is, number one. Next topic, Robert McNamara's recommendations on nuclear disarmament and ballistic missile defense. Now, you make a couple of specific and forceful policy proposals in your book. One build down the nuclear weapons. I quote you, the political will must be found to undertake a process of radical, rapid denuclearization. President Bush has proposed dramatic reductions in our nuclear forces. I, the right move? I endorse that wholeheartedly. But, let, let me, no, well, right, let, let me just take 30 seconds to say where we are today. As we speak, in the U.S., we have 7,500 strategic nuclear warheads in a sense directed against Russia, each one on average 20 times the kill capability of the Hiroshima bomb, which killed 200,000 people. Of the 7,500, 2,500 are on 15-minute alert to be launched on warning. Those in your audience who saw President Bush inaugurated, saw him put his hand on the, on the Bible, swear his oath, then there was a little milling around because most many of the people were going inside the Capitol for lunch. And while the milling around took place, a blue-suited officer stepped behind President Bush. He carried the football. He carried the briefcase. It carries the electronic codes without which our nuclear wards cannot be armed. And that briefcase has to be within arm's length of the President, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, because he may arm them and may launch them. 2,500 on 15-minute alert with a kill capability, 50,000 times that of their human mind. It's, it's insane. Now, he, to his great credit, has said, uh, and not quite use the word insane, but he said, uh, in effect, we've got to move out of this. And therefore, he says, I think we can move unilaterally. Now, he hadn't said to what level, but uh, he's, talk he's implied perhaps to taking down from 7,500 to something on the order of 2,500 or 1,500. I strongly applaud that. And in addition, with reference to this, uh, 2,500 on 15 minute, uh, I'll call it hair trigger alert, he said we've got to reduce the alert status and it ought to be done preferably by separating warheads from the launch vehicles. So those two moves I strongly suggest, strongly support. It'll take us, if we were to start tomorrow, it'd take us five years to implement that. At the end of that time, we ought to think about the next moves and ultimately I would favor Elimination or near elimination, you know, five or 10 or 15, we won't argue about that. But essentially eliminating the risk of destruction of societies, really the risk of, of destruction of civilization. What about his proposal for a ballistic missile defense? Uh, I'm not going to discuss that today because, oh. for this reason. All right. Uh, well, for two reasons. Number one, I'm biased. I initiated the action in, uh, in uh, November 1966 in Austin. Cy Vance was my deputy. He and I and the five chiefs of staff were down there meeting with President Johnson. And at that meeting, uh, I initiated the action to st that led ultimately to the uh, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which was signed in, uh, about... Uh, 1972, as I 1972, right. that's uh, six years later. That's exactly right. It took that long to persuade the Russians to go along with it. Right. And that is, in my opinion, the foundation of strategic stability. Now, he is moving, I'll call it, in ways that might abrogate that. But he, he has not described what it is called the architecture of a ballistic missile defense system. We don't know whether it's a space-based system, a land-based, sea-based, or all three. And but, until but, he does, I'm not going to uh, Okay, so what I'm after here, though, but in principle, then, you don't object. You, it, it, it's a question of detail well, it, and nuance I, I, and bringing I, the Russians along with us in some way. That's the point. We've got to bring the Russians along with us so they do not feel right. we're destroying their deterrent. Now, China is a totally different situation. 
they have on the order of 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles or nuclear warheads capable of attacking the U.S. They have felt that that 20 brought them deterrence of our strike against them. They are absolutely certain that that deterrence will be destroyed if we deploy anything uh, in the way of a ballistic missile defense, even along the lines that Clinton was talking about. That's a major problem. We've got to talk okay, that let out. Me, let Last, let me ask Robert McNamara about his vision for America's overall role in the 21st century. I want to get you to your, your uh, proposal that you call the multilateral imperative. A again, let me quote you. Yeah. The United States, under this imperative, the United States will not apply its economic, political, or military power unilaterally other than in the unlikely circumstances of a defense of the continental United States, Hawaii, and Alaska. Okay, that's your statement. Now, that's correct. October 1973, first week of the Israeli-Arab War goes very badly for Israel, and Richard Nixon, acting unilaterally, I believe he had some support from the Portuguese, but it was essentially a unilateral American action, told the Soviets not to interfere and resupplied the Israelis and very likely saved the state of Israel. Would you really want us to bind ourselves to multilateral action such that we could not engage in an action like that ever again? You, you uh, either don't know or have forgotten some of your history. All right, <laughs> fill me in. Nixon didn't do that for the first time. In June of 67, the hotline was used for the first time. I was secretary at the time. Johnson was president. Kasigan, you have the advantage of not only knowing your history, but having lived it. Go ahead. Kasigan, in the exchange of messages, first use of the hotline, one of the messages said, if you want war, you'll get war. Now, why did that kind of a message come? Because the Egyptians were, were absolutely intent on literally eliminating Israel as a state in the world. They were going to destroy Israel. Israel knew that. Israel preempted. They knocked the hell out of the Egyptians. Then the Egyptians lied, literally. Nasser, a year later, told Life magazine he had lied. He called King Hussein of Jordan and said, the American carrier in the Sixth Fleet is bombing Cairo, and you, you Hussein, and Jordan have got to come in and help us. So Hussein came in, attacked Israel, and Israel knocked the hell out of Hussein. So then we're left with Syria and Russia. And we were concerned that Russia would support Syria and attack Israel. So unilaterally, we moved the fleet back toward, it was steaming west, we moved it steaming east to help protect Israel. That was a unilateral action. There are exceptions to every rule. I don't want to say there aren't. But generally speaking, we should lead. All right. We should not apply our But you would not. you would not forswear. Oh, there are All certain right. circumstances. OK. Now, Fi let me push you one last time. Here's my final question. Sure. You speak of Woodrow Wilson. Yes. The book is entitled Wilson's Ghost. Let me contrast Wilson with a man who preceded him as president, Theodore Roosevelt. In temperament, you could hardly ask for a different, greater contrast, but also in, um, in their outlook on policy. Roosevelt insisted on American strength, speak softly and carry a big stick. He went so far as to send the American fleet on a tour to impress the world with our power, never doubted the superiority of American values, and he so earned the respect of other major players in the world that he was called in to mediate the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, which won him the Nobel Peace Prize. Woodrow Wilson, an idealist, loses control of events at Versailles, an internationalist, he fails in his effort to get the Senate to ratify the League of Nations. So on the one hand, you have Wilson, idealism, internationalism, multiculturalism, and failure. Theodore Roosevelt, utter confidence in American values and might, and a Nobel Peace Prize. Shouldn't we be listening to Roosevelt's ghost? Well, I think we can listen to Roosevelt's ghost for leadership. Right. But not for unilateral application of power. And essentially, Roosevelt Because he did, was wrong or the world is different? Well, well I'd say, it wasn't so much he was wrong. He didn't suggest unilateral application of U.S. power uh, across the world. He did apply it in, some, I'll call it a couple of minor instances unilaterally, but it, he, he, was, he was an active leader. Uh, and that's what I think the U.S. should be today, an active leader. Wilson was trying to be an active leader. He failed on something that today I think is absolutely fundamental organization of multilateral structures in the world to deal with this globalizing world that we have. And one of those, one of those multilateral structures that needs strengthening, for sure, is the United Nations. In a sense, 
the United Nations is, is the, the heritage of Wilson. It's, it's today's replacement of the League of Nations. It badly needs restructuring. The Security Council, the role of the Secretary General, both need to be strengthened. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wilson's ghost. Is it a phantom, as Robert McNamara believes, that should inspire us with its idealism? Or is it a specter that should simply haunt us with a sense of its failed naivete? I'm Peter Robinson. Thanks for joining us. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. This is PBS.